Good morning, church family. So good to be with you. Let's do a deep dive into the book of 1 Peter this morning. Would you join me? However you get into God's Word, find the book of 1 Peter. If you like to use the Bibles that are hopefully somewhere, somewhere underneath your chair or around you, just turn to page 1211 and you'll be home. We're just going to look at the first two verses of the book of 1 Peter as we enter into this new series we're calling A Sojourner's Guide. So let me, let me sort of preface and set the table for this entire uh, series by um, retelling the story of Peter. Would you enter into uh, the story with me with Peter? Let's just go back. So let's, you know, you're this, this sort of kind of average guy in the Middle East and you grow up and you don't come from a lot of money, but you're, but you're, you're not poor either. You're just kind of middle of the road guy and most likely your dad's a fisherman. And so when you come of age, you, um, you know, you don't get, uh, money for higher education, and, and you're not an overly religious guy, so you don't want to become a rabbi. You're just kind of a normal guy, and so you most likely go into the trade of your father, so you become a fisherman, and so does your brother, and, and so you guys just sort of decide to go into business together, and you just go fishing, and unfortunately for you, every story account of you fishing, you come up empty-handed, but somehow, even still, you convince this, this woman to marry you, and you, you get a family, and you start a family, and you live in her hometown, and this is kind of life for you. You just go to work, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes you fish all night just to, you know, catch some fish and sell them and just provide for your family. And this, this is life for you. Until one day, you're doing your thing, fishing, coming up empty-handed again. And this, this new rabbi on the scene comes along the shoreline and looks at you and says, hey, you, you come follow me. And you kind of do one of these me? Yeah, you. And you literally drop your nets. You drop everything, your livelihood, you leave your family, and you follow this new rabbi, Jesus. And man, what an education. You learn a lot. Now, you kind of stumbling and bumbling along the way, and you say some things, and you get in a little bit of trouble. But you're also the one who, when you guys were all in a boat, and you saw Jesus walk on water, you're the only one who stepped had the faith to, to step out of the boat and walk on water, at least for a little while. And, and then when, when there's a time when people were like, who is this Jesus guy? I'm trying to figure out who he is. Jesus says to you, hey, Peter, who do you think I am? And you say, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, right on, man. God gave you that word. So things are going along pretty well for you. And then after that, Jesus even changes your name. You grew up Simon, but, but Jesus changes your name. He says, no longer are you going to be Simon. Now you're going to be called Peter, which means the rock. So before there was Dwayne Johnson, there's the apostle Peter, all right? <laughs> He's the rock. He's the original rock. And on you, I will build my church. The apostles, the Bible says, Jesus Christ being the chief uh, cornerstone and the apostles, the cornerstone, were built upon him and their faith and their leadership. They are the foundation of the church. You're Peter. Well, things are going along okay until one day after about three and a half years of following Jesus, one of your buddies betrays him. They come and arrest him, and he's put on trial. And it's the trial to the death. And at his very greatest hour of need, when he really needed a friend to stand by him, you denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times. You denied even knowing him. Well, then your, your, your rabbi, your teacher, your Lord and Savior dies, and you, with regret and shame, you don't know where else to go, you don't know what else to do, so you just kind of go back to doing what you did before. You go back to fishing. You go back home, go back to your family, and you go back to fishing. And one day you're trying to catch fish again, again, empty-handed, no fish. This guy comes on shore and says, hey man, throw, throw your net to the other side of the boat. And so you do, and all these fish hop into your net, and immediately you realize, it's the Lord. He's risen from the dead, and he's back. And you're not alone in the boat. All the other guys, the Apostle John, your buddy, said, 
Man, it's the Lord. And you, out of all the guys, you're the only one who put on his outer garment, jumped into the water, and got to the shore as fast as you could. All the other guys rode back to shore, but not you. You were so excited to see Jesus again. You literally hopped in the water, got there as fast as you could, and embraced him and gave him a big old wet hug. That's how I pictured it. (laughs) Jesus had already started a fire on the shore there and was grilling some fish and said, Hey, man, come have a seat. Let's have breakfast. Fish for breakfast. And finally, the other guys roar in you know, their boat in the shore. Of course, they wanted all the fish, too. They are fishermen, you know. So they bring all the fish to the shore, and finally you, you sit down together, and you have some breakfast, and you're talking to Jesus. But then finally Jesus says, hey, Peter, let's go for a walk. So you and Peter, just one on, Peter and Jesus, just you, you and Jesus go for a walk, just, just the two of you. And Jesus, for every time you denied him, he restores you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. And from that moment on, you became a passionate shepherd of the flock of God. Once God filled you with his Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, you became this dynamic, vocal leader in the church. And you indeed devoted the rest of your life to shepherding the flock of God and answering the call of God on your life. And one of the ways that you did that was by writing the church a letter. And in the opening of that letter, you said this. Peter. An apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Okay, first, Peter identifies himself, all right? This is who I am. No longer am I Simon, now I'm Peter, I'm the rock. And no longer am I a fisherman, no longer am I just a disciple, no longer am I just one who's a confessor, no longer am I one who's who's just a, a pastor, now I'm actually an apostle. An apostle, the word means a sent out one. So when you're an apostle, you are sent out in the name of and with the authority of the one who sends you. Peter says, I'm an apostle of Jesus the Messiah. He sent me out. I go in his name and with his authority. That's who I am. I'm the rock and I'm an apostle. That's who I am. Kind of a little bit of that. All right. I'm Peter the apostle. And then who is he writing to? Here is the who, what, and why I believe, of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Here's the heart of his message. He's identified who he is, and now this is who we are. First, he says, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout all that region. All right? We got to camp out on that. To those who reside as aliens. All right. This word, I think we're going to see, has a double meaning. First, it it has a meaning of just a literal, physical uh, residence as aliens. Not aliens, children, as in you know, from another galaxy, but aliens as in, as in from another country, all right? Uh, this word is used three times in the New Testament, twice in this book, and once in the book of Hebrews, all right? So first of all, we're talking literally or physically. Let me explain. Here's a map. So you can see to the left the boot of Italy, all right? And then to the right uh, is what they called back in the New Testament times Asia Minor. It's modern-day Turkey, all right? So you see the Black Sea up to the north, and right under Black Sea, there you see Pontus. And if you just sort of make a uh, clockwise circle, I think this letter was written originally to be circulated, all right? So there's Pontus, Cappadocia, Galatia, Asia, and Bithynia. You can sort of see this, or that's clockwise, clockwise circle, right? I think this letter historically, literally was meant to be circulated among the church that had been scattered. People were uh, followers of Christ living in this region. Now, they were originally living in Rome, but now they're in this region. They had scattered and left all the way to this region. Why? Well, it's because of this man, Nero. 
This guy was the emperor of Rome. And then here's what happened historically. In A.D. 64, uh, there was a major fire. There's a famous fire called the Burning of Rome in the summer of 64. And many people were accusing him of starting it. And so to deflect blame and criticism, he decided to blame the Christians. It was the Christians who started the fire. And so now everybody's mad at the Christians. And so Nero uses his army to gather up many Christians, and he does unspeakable, horrible, barbaric, gruesome things to them, including burning them, putting them on a stake, burning them, using them as torches to light the way down a path. True story. So you can see why many of the Christians fled Rome and they went to this region. They are scattered. They're, they're living in countries that are not their own. All right? They're sojourners. This word was meant literally, historically, physically in the first way. But also, beloved, we're going to see that this word has a double meaning. It's meant to be used spiritually as well. I mentioned that this word is used three times in the New Testament, twice in this book and once in the book of Hebrews. Here's the Hebrews passage, 1113. And all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. There it is. Not just that they were foreigners and strangers living in other countries, or that they were aliens, but they are actually sojourners of the earth. This is the biblical truth. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you get a new citizenship. Paul says you become citizens of heaven, and so now life here, this entire earth, you become a resident alien. It's just this word has sort of a transitory temporal sense to it. You are just passing through. You are on your way home, and this changes everything. You're a sojourner. That's why we decided to call this, this book a sojourner's guide. A guide. This is the Apostle Peter's guidance to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and how to guide our lives as sojourners of the earth. I don't care what your passport says. You're an alien here in this world if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Or you're just a resident alien. You're a sojourner here. And that changes everything. Okay? So that's the who of being a fully devoted follower of Christ. Here's the what. He said, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout that region, who are chosen, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Here we go. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Some of our Calvinists in here just got really excited. All right. So we are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. What does that mean? I personally believe that means that we're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. It's kind of what I take. I'm a pretty simple guy. I take what it says. So some people say, well, I chose to believe in God, or I chose to believe in Christ. Okay, but here's the truth. God chose you first. That's the truth. Well, Pastor Sherman, how do you know that? Ephesians 1. Look on the screen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Here it is. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his good pleasure and will. My beloved, the reason why if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus, the reason why you have that is because God chose you before the foundation of the world. And he did so because he delighted to do so. He did it according to his pleasure and will. That's why. You were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. It's God's doing. It's a similar way in which he chose the nation of Israel. Look at this next passage out of Deuteronomy. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. So God chose the nation of Israel to be his chosen people. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love everybody. He loves everybody. It's just he had to choose a nation through whom he would give us the Messiah, through whom he would save and bless the world. And he chose Israel to be... to the nation he would bless and through whom he would bless the world. And so it is with us in the church. Not that we've taken Israel's place. The Bible says actually we were grafted into Israel. So it's in the same way in which he chose Israel. He has chosen us 
out of the foreknowledge and out of the good pleasure and will of God. Not that he doesn't love everybody. He loves everybody, but he chose us. I know there's a mystery to this. Get comfortable with the mystery. You're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, let's talk about foreknowledge. What does that mean? Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. What does foreknowledge mean? All right. Obviously, you can see in the word foreknowledge. It's like before knowledge, where God knew before. So yes, it has a sense of God knowing ahead of time, but but there's more to this word than that. It also means to set, intentionally set your affection and love upon someone or something. So ahead of time, God intentionally set his love and affection upon you. Let me illustrate it this way, best way I can think of. Um, When my wife was pregnant with our first child, Emily, I used to talk to Emily when she was in the womb, all right? It was a little weird at first talking to your wife's belly, uh, but I had heard that the, the children in, in the womb can, can hear you. And isn't it cool that science is finally catching up to the Bible, you know? So apparently what scientists have discovered is for the last 10 weeks of pregnancy, a baby can absorb sound. So I would talk to Emily regularly when she was in the womb. Call her by name and sing her some songs and all that. So then finally she's born. And out she comes and she's crying and I'm crying and uh, the the doctors are great and the nurses are great. Doctors and nurses, y'all are awesome. All right. And they do all their thing and I cut the umbilical cord and then they, you know, wrap her up and clean her up. And finally she's just crying, 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 crying. And finally they give her to me. And I hold her like this, and uh, I begin to speak to her. I call her by name and just start talking to her. And she calms down. She stops crying. And she listens because she recognized my voice. It's a true story. I called her by name and she heard me. Beloved, that's foreknowledge. If you are in Christ, if Christ is in you, God has been calling you by name before the creation of the world. And then you heard his voice, you heard the gospel, and you answered, and you're born again. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God your Father. All right? How? Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Notice that uh, this is all the work of the whole Trinity of God. All right? Look again. Verse 2, please. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. That's obviously his death through the crucifixion. The entire trinity of God is involved in your salvation, all right? God does all the work in your salvation. This is is a great truth we just need to accept. I used to think, man, aren't I wise? Aren't I smart? I chose Jesus. I'm so smart. And then I read Romans 8. Here's what Romans 8 says, all right? For those God foreknew, there's our word, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Please observe, all the action verbs in this verse are done by the subject, who is God. God's doing all the work. He is the captain of your salvation. He is sovereign over your salvation from beginning to end, before the creation of the world and unto eternity. God's got this. And so I just, I just pray for you, and I hope you receive this doctrinal truth, that it just settles your soul, that the sovereign God is the captain of my salvation from beginning to end. And I know some of you parents have expressed concerns with me about your children's salvation. And I just want to settle your hearts on this truth as well for your children. If Christ is in them and they are in Christ, Even if they make bad decisions and go off and do things, the sovereign God's the captain of their salvation. Just settle your soul on that. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
Okay, so that's the who and that's the what of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, here's the why. Why did God do all this? It says, look again, to obey Jesus Christ. This is the why, to obey Jesus Christ. May I just tell it to you straight because I love you. God didn't captain uh, your salvation so that you could live for yourself according to your plan and your wishes and your dreams and for your glory. That's not why. God was the captain of your salvation. He foreknew you. He called you to himself. He did all the work that was necessary to save you so that you would live for him according to his plans and his wishes and for his glory. He saved you that you would obey Jesus Christ. That word obey means to literally hear under. That's what the word means. Those of you in our Trinity U Greek class can understand this better. It's a compound word with the word under, hypo, like when something's hyper, it's above, like our children and their energy level, right? They're hyper, that's above. But when something's hypo, that means it's below, right? So this is hypo and then the word to hear. So it means to hear under. So in other words, that's obedience. It has a spirit of submission to it. So in other words, you say in your flesh, well, I want to go over here and do that. But God says, no, you can't go over there and do that. Well, then you say, okay, yes, Lord, I hear under. I come under your word and I won't go do that. Or you say the opposite is true. Man, I really don't want to go do that. But God says, you know, I really want you to go do that. And you say, okay, Lord, I hear under and I submit and I go. That's obedience. That's the abundant life in Jesus. This is why he came. This is what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. This is what he said in his final commission to us after the resurrection, before he ascended up to the right hand of the Father, he gave us the great commission in Matthew 28. This is what it says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and here's our line, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. My neighbors and friends, straight up. That's what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. You obey him in everything. Listen, man, every day counts. Every word counts. Every deed counts. It all counts. It all matters. You learn to obey him in everything. That's the who, what, and why of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so this fisherman turned disciple, turned confessor, denier, pastor, and apostle, commissioned by Jesus to shepherd you. This is the first thing he wants you to know, is who God is to you and who you are to him. You are a sojourner here. You are chosen according to the intentional affection of God so that you would live your life to the fullest for him. Let the Apostle Peter shepherd your soul.